Hey everybody, welcome back to the Halloween 2019 edition of Reading with Mrs. H. I'm Mrs. H and we are reading Took by Mary Downing Hahn. We are going to go ahead and continue. The next chapter is chapter number three. The next day, we went to Home Depot. We couldn't afford to paint the outside of the house yet. That would have to wait. But we could afford to make the inside look better. I chose blue for my room, and Erica chose lavender for hers. Mom and Dad picked shades of beige for everything else, except for the kitchen, which was to be yellow. A bright, cheerful color, Mom said. It took a week to paint the house. All of us, even Erica, helped scrape and sand and clean the walls. When we finally finished, the place looked more like home. Our pictures on the walls, our furniture in the rooms, our books on the bookshelves. We ate dinner at our dining room table, using our plates and glasses and silverware. We ate breakfast and lunch at our kitchen table. Mom's collection of teapots appeared on a shelf in the kitchen. My <laughs> Dad helped her set up a loom in the little room upstairs. He organized his office and arranged his pipe collection in his barrister bookcase. He hung his diploma from UMass. In my room, I lined up my books on a shelf Dad made for me. I kept my Star Wars figures and my puzzle collection on their own shelves. Posters of Spider-Man and Captain America hung on one wall. A movie ad for The Hobbit hung between the windows on the opposite wall. I was beginning to feel at home. Erica finally unpacked her boxes and hung up her clothes. She folded underwear and socks and t-shirts and put them in her bureau drawers. She arranged books and found places for her dolls and stuffed animals. When she was finished, her room looked exactly like her room in Fairfield. Her lavender-checked curtains fit the new windows and the paint matched her old walls. The only difference was the view. Woods and fields and mountains instead of green lawns and neighbors' houses. The next week, Mom enrolled Erica and me in school. It was our first trip to Woodville itself. The shopping center on the outskirts of town had a Home Depot, a Walmart, and a Piggly Wiggly grocery store, as well as a nail salon, a liquor store, an insurance agent, a bank, Joe's Pizza, and a real estate office with faded photos of houses for sale taped to the windows. What more did we need? Dad asked. Whatever it was, we wouldn't find it in Woodville, except for a used clothing store, a bar, and a thrift shop. The buildings on Main Street were boarded up. Even the graffiti was faded. Narrow streets ran uphill from one side of Main Street and downtown and downhill from the other side. Dogs barked as we drove by. A gust of wind blew newspapers down the street. We didn't see a single person. The whole town could have been abandoned, as far as I could tell, except for the dogs, of course. Next time, we'll take the scenic route, Mom said, if there is one. She turned off Main Street and drove uphill through a neighborhood of old houses that were slightly nicer than the ones we had seen so far. The Woodville School was at the top of the hill, kindergarten through eighth grade, which meant that Erica's second grade classroom and my seventh grade classroom would be in the same building. The school was made of dark gray stone and had tall, narrow windows. A steep flight of steps led to the main entrance, a big black door. It might as well have been named the Bastille School for Bad Boys and Girls. Erica clung to Mom's hand. I don't want to go here. It's ugly. Don't be silly. Shaking her hand free, Mom pulled open the door. It will be fine, she added. Just give it time. I knew by the uncertainty in her voice that she didn't believe her own words. But what could she do? It was the only school in town. Mom let us into an office filled with old-fashioned dark furniture. 
a thin woman looked up from the typewriter and did a funny thing with her mouth, which I think was meant to be a smile. Her hair was pulled tightly back from her face, and she wore a plain black dress with long sleeves. She scared Erica and made me nervous. Even Mom looked uncomfortable. According to the sign on her desk, she was Miss Danvers, school sec secretary. You must be Mrs. Anderson, Anderson, she said to Mom. Are you Erica and Daniel? Welcome to Woodville, Woodville Elementary. While Erica and I sat side by side, as silent as mutes, Mom filled out forms. Miss Danvers returned to her typing. I watched, fascinated by the sight of a real live person using an antique instead of a computer. Their official transcripts should arrive any day, Mom said as she handed Miss Danvers the completed paperwork. A bald guy with a gray mustache stuck his head out of an inner door and smiled at us. I'm Mr. Sykes, the principal. I hope you two will enjoy our school. A bit smaller than you're used to, I'm sure. Not as up to date, maybe, but... The phone in his office rang, and he excused himself to answer it. I knew sarcasm when I heard it. Miss Danvers led the three of us down a hall. The walls were grayish green and bare. No bright paintings, no starred reports, no posters. The closed doors to classrooms were unadorned, too. It was very different from the schools I'd gone to in Connecticut. Miss Danvers stopped at a door labeled 7th grade. Wait here, she told Mom and Erica. <clears throat> Opening the door, she ushered me into the room. The teacher was a large woman with a stern face. She looked at me as if I were an invasive species. The kids in the room stared at me. They sat in old-fashioned one-piece desks arranged in straight rows from the front to the back of the room. No artwork, no projects, just the flag and a faded portrait of George Washington. The blackboard was made of slate, and sticks of chalk and erasers lay on the ledge beneath it. It looked like a classroom from an old black-and-white movie. I glanced over my shoulder. Mom was staring into the room in disbelief. Daniel, this is Miss Min Mincham, your teacher, Miss Danvers said. Turning to the class, she said, Boys and girls, Daniel's from Connecticut, that little state near New York City. Their eyes flickered over me, taking in my khaki pants, turtleneck sweater, and parka. Standard clothing in either Pine Ridge or Carson Middle School, but not here. The uniform for boys... Both boys and girls seemed to be jeans and t-shirts, old and faded, either too big or too small. A boy in the back of the room snickered. He must have been 15 or 16 years old from the size of him. Two girls whispered to each other and giggled. Miss Mincham rose to her feet, an awe-inspiring sight. Almost six feet tall and weighing about 200 pounds, she frowned at the boy in the back row and the two girls. Then she told me to take a seat in the back row, the empty one next to the giant boy. The class was studying history. Miss Mincham called out events from the Revolutionary War and asked kids to supply the dates when they happened. I've never been good at remembering stuff like that, so I didn't do any better than the rest of them. When she shifted the subject to math, she sent us to the blackboards for drills in long division. English consisted of reciting rules of grammar, and geography was naming capitals of foreign countries. In the cafeteria, a kid knocked my lunch tray out of my hand and pretended it was an accident. In gym class, a bunch of boys cornered me in the locker room and shoved me around, sneering at my clothes and snobby accent. Ignoring their behavior, the gym teacher blew his whistle and yelled, Okay, that's enough. Out on the floor. Let's play some basketball. I was bumped into, tripped, and hit on the head with a ball. All accidentally, of course. By the end of the day, I hated Woodville School. I found Erica, and we boarded the bus that would take us home. The driver was a woman named Mrs. Plummer, the first nice person I'd met all day. She told us 
Our stop was the last one. It's a long ride, she said. As we rumbled along narrow roads, uphill and down, letting kids off at farms and trailer parks along the way, the boy behind me kicked at the back of my seat, and his friend said things like, I'm from Connecticut and I'm better than you, in what he thought was a good imitation of the accent I never knew I had. Finally, there was one kid on the bus besides Erica and me. Despite the lurching ride, he staggered up the aisle and sat in front of us. Leaning over the back of the seat, he stared at us. He was maybe 10 years old, a scrawny boy with dingy blonde hair and sad brown eyes. He looked as if soap was not used in his house, either on him or on his clothes. My stop is the last one, he said. Did you forget to get off? No, I said. We're the last stop. He shook his head. There's no stop after mine. We just moved here, I told him. We live on a farm just over the bridge. His eyes widened. You live on the Estes family farm? I shrugged. Maybe. I don't know who used to live in our house. I glanced at Erica, who was staring at the boy. Is something wrong with where we live? She asked. It's where the girl disappeared, he said. What girl? I nudged her. Don't listen to him. He's just trying to scare us. He looked at me. I'm not lying, if that's what you think. Just any, just ask anyone about Celine Estes. They'll tell you. He shoved his face close to Erica's. Something got, got her and drug her away, and nobody ever saw her again. Erica drew back, her eyes fearful. Nothing dragged her away, I told him. She got lost and fell off a cliff or something. Ha, the boy said. That's what you think. There's things out in these woods people from Connecticut ain't ever heard of. With a grinding of gears, the bus stopped and the boy got off. I looked out the window and saw him standing by the road, making a face at me. Then we jolted and bumped and swayed around a curve and up a hill, leaving him and his stories behind. The bus made its next and final stop at the end of our driveway. As we got off, the driver, Mrs. Plummer, leaned in, leaned out the door and called, Don't believe anything Brody Mason tells you. He's a born liar, that boy. As the bus drove away, Erica told me, Do you think a girl disappeared from our house? Of course not, I said. You heard what that bus driver said. Brody or Brady or whatever his name is, is a liar. He was trying to scare you. He did scare me. She fumbled to adjust the shoulder strap on her backpack. He wasn't lying, Daniel. I could tell. I straightened her strap for her. Listen, Erica, that boy was definitely lying. And do you know why? The kids here don't like us. We're outsiders. That's why they're so mean. Erica turned to me, her eyes bright with tears. My teacher, Mrs. Klein, is mean too. Even meaner than Miss Davis back at public school in Fairfield. She kept me in at recess and made me write 100 times, I will not daydream in class. The girl who sits behind me whispered that I'm ugly. At lunchtime, the girls laughed at me and said I talk funny and wear weird clothes. They wouldn't let me sit at a table with them either. It was exactly the same in my class, I told her. I got beaten up in gym, and my teacher called me stupid because I didn't know the capital of Rhode Island. I'm sorry, Rhodesia. <laughs> or the exact date um, George Washington crossed the Delaware. Let alone rules of grammar, which nobody ever taught me. Maybe Mom will teach us at home. I shook my head. No, she'll just tell us to be patient, and the kids will start liking us. You know, all of a sudden, they'll realize how nice we are, even if we do come from Connecticut. You don't believe that, do you? No, I said. In fact, I don't think even Mom believes it. Erica frowned. Do you hear noises at night? I looked at her, surprised by the sudden change of subject. Do you? Sometimes I hear a sort of whispering, almost like someone's calling me. It sounds like this. Erica, 
Erica. She said it in a low, scary voice, a weird, drawn-out version of her name. It's just the wind, I told her. Hear it blowing in the tops of the trees? It sounds like it's whispering up there. Erica shook her head. No, it's not like the trees or the wind. It's my name. Then it whispers other things. I can almost make out the words, but not quite. She broke away from me and then ran to meet Mom on the front porch, her red hair flying in the breeze, her backpack bouncing. I followed her slowly, thinking about what she had said. I was sure that Erica had imagined the whispering voice, but when I looked at the woods behind the house, I felt my chest tighten with anxiety. In the late afternoon light, the shadows of the trees stretched across the field. The woods were already dark, and the mountainsides were in shadow. Mom waved to me from the porch, and I broke into a run, suddenly eager to be inside, safe from whatever might be hiding in those woods, things that didn't exist in Connecticut. Chapter number four. After dinner that night, Erica told Mom and Dad about the boy on the bus and what he'd told us. Our parents agreed with me. This was an old, old farm, and no one had lived in the house for a long time. It was exactly the sort of place that inspired people to make up stories. It must be a country version of an ur urban legend, Dad said. Like the man with a... Mom stopped him with a sharp look. The man with a what? Erica asked. The man with a monkey, I said, to rescue Dad. I definitely didn't want him telling Erica about the man with the hook. In fact, I myself didn't want to hear that story. Not here, not at night, not when anything could be out there howling in the dark, watching us through the tall living room windows Mom hadn't gotten around to covering with curtains. Does the monkey disappear? Erica persisted. Of course not, I told her. He and the man run away from the circus and live happily ever after in a tar paper shack. Erica laughed. And they eat wild berries for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Dad winked at me. Exactly. Erica snuggled beside Mom on the couch and listened to a chapter of The Moffats, a book Mom loved when she was Erica's age, and still did. But when it was time for bed, Erica said, I don't want to go upstairs. It's so dark outside my window. Daniel's right across the hall from you, Mom said, and Dad and I are in the next room. Will you come with me, Mommy? Erica asked, and tuck me in and sit with me until I fall asleep. Dad sighed. Give in now, Martha, and it'll be the same every night. Either Mom didn't hear him, or she ignored him. Scooping Erica up as if she were still a baby, she carried her upstairs. Dad shook his head. Your mother is spoiling that child. I shrugged, opened my odious social studies book, and began memorizing the imports, exports, and native products of Germany. What a waste of time Woodville School was. My textbook had been published 30 years ago. When I passed Erica's door later, I heard my sister say, Are you sure it's just a legend? Yes, Mom said. Please stop worrying about it. No one disappeared. A girl named Celine never lived here, and that boy was a liar. The next morning, Erica and I sat in the front of the school bus right behind Mrs. Plummer. The bus slowed for the second stop, and Brody got on. Erica stared out the window, pretending not to see him, but I gave him a dirty look. He made an ugly face, sat down behind us, and began kicking the back of my seat. As the bus filled with kids, Brody told them where Erica and I lived. One girl said she never walked down the road past our driveway. Her friend claimed that her big sister and some of her friends drove up the driveway on a dare. It was a few years ago when no one lived in the house. They heard people crying and wailing and calling Celine's name. They didn't see nothing, but they got out of there fast. Erica pressed her fingers in her ears and hummed, but I listened to every word. If I was dumb enough to believe their stories, a family named Estes lived on the farm about 40 or 50 years ago, maybe more. No one was sure. It was before they were born, but their parents, or maybe their grandparents, remembered it. 
they had a daughter named Celine, and she disappeared when she was seven years old, and no one ever found her. One said she was took. Maybe it was the demons in the woods, a boy suggested. Maybe old auntie, the conjure woman up on Brewster's Hill, got her, Brody said. Or worst of all, a girl said, old auntie's razorback hog, the one called Bloody Bones, ate her up. Nobody agreed who took Celine, but they all agreed she was never found. By the time we arrived at school, Erica was trembling. We waited until the bus was empty and then got up to leave. Mrs. Plummer stopped Erica. <clears throat> Don't let them scare you, she told my sister. It's just a yarn people have been spinning for years, not to speak, not a speck of truth in it. A girl named Celine disappeared, but she wasn't took. There's no conjure woman and no bloody bones. She rummaged in her purse, pulled out a pack of lifesavers, and handed it to Erica. Help yourself. You too. We each took one and thanked her. They're not really bad kids, Miss Plummer said. Just nobody's taught them manners. They've grown up as wild as bears in the woods. Give them time. They'll get friendly when they're used to you. A week passed, <clears throat> and another week followed. But those kids didn't get used to Erica and me. They didn't even try. Luckily, Mrs. Plummer saved the seat behind her for us, so no one could say or do anything to us without getting kicked off the bus. All right, side note, I keep finding errors in this book, and it's very distracting. Uh, I see Miss Plummer and Mrs. Plummer. It's one or the other. Okay. <laughs> um, even so, they found ways to torment us with stories of Celine Estes. A whisper here, a comment there, a note or a drawing passed to us. When we were off the bus, with no Mrs. Plummer to protect us, the boys continued to knock me around on the playground, and the girls whispered about Erica. Unlike Mrs. Plummer, our teachers never noticed, or maybe they just didn't care. Mom and Dad didn't have any more luck in Woodville than we did. The adults disliked them for the same reasons the kid disliked Erica and me. They were especially offended by our failure to join the only church in town. We weren't only outsiders, we were godless outsiders. As far as jobs went, neither Dad nor Mom found a position in Woodville. Not that there was much to choose from. Dad finally got a job at Home Depot, where he wore a big orange apron and helped people find tools, paint, garbage cans, plumbing supplies, and whatever else they were looking for. Most often, the restrooms. Soon after, Mom landed a position as a receptionist at the real estate office on the other side of the parking lot from the Home Depot. Nobody there cared where my parents came from or if they went to church. The people who worked at the shopping center were practically all outsiders themselves. From cities such as Charleston in Woodville, they claimed, you'd never be accepted if you weren't married to your cousin. Dad laughed at this, but Mom said it was an ignorant way to talk. And I agree with Mom. On week weekends, Dad and I got into the habit of spending our free time roaming the woods and fields, following trails made long ago by trappers and hunters. He was forever stopping to take pictures of a lichen-covered boulder or a mossy log or a tangle of branches, a gnarled tree, a hawk or a crow in flight. But I didn't mind. I loved being in the woods with him. Neither Mom nor Erica went with us. Mom had too much to do, she said, and Erica had no interest in the great outdoors. While Mom busied herself weaving, Erica sat nearby, rereading Little House on the Prairie books or playing with little Erica. Sometimes she drew picture stories in her sketch pads. Sometimes she painted with watercolors. She seemed perfectly content until the day ended. When night came, she grew fearful and clung to Mom. She still spoke of hearing scary whispers in the dark corners of her room. On this particular day, a Saturday, Mom was working at the realtor's office. Erica didn't want to stay home alone, 
so she agreed to go with Dad and me. Although it was sunny, the wind was brisk, so we pulled on heavy sweaters and wrapped scarves around our necks. Erica dressed little Erica in a sweater that matched hers and wrapped a bandana around the doll's neck. The wind ripped leaves from the trees and filled the air with a whirling gold. Dad tried to capture the last of the foliage, but the color had peaked and many of the trees were bare. His camera swinging from its strap, his hiking stick in hand, Dad chose a trail that led uphill, winding around boulders and outcrops of trees. After a while, we came to a steep drop-off on one side of the trail. Not exactly a cliff, but a high enough to do serious harm. Maybe even kill you if you fell. Just looking down, down, down at the rocks far below was enough to make me step back toward the safe side of the trail, far from the edge. Erica f clung, froze and clung to Dad's hand. I'm scared of high places, she whispered. Can we turn around and go home now? leaving Dad to convince Erica that he wouldn't let her fall. I ran ahead, bounding from rock to rock. If I'd been looking where I was going, I might not have tripped on a tangle of roots half hidden in the fallen leaves. But the next thing I knew was I was flat on the ground on my belly, struggling to get my breath. I looked through the weeds at a chimney pointing like a finger to the sky. Scrambling to my feet, I followed an overgrown path to the ruins of an old log cabin that was slowly sinking into the earth. Overgrown with dying vines, shielded by brambles, its walls tilted and sagged. Part of the roof had collapsed under the weight of a fallen tree, but the stone chimney was straight and true. Dad! Erica! I yelled. There's an old cabin here! They made their way through the weeds and undergrowth. Dad leading and Erica following, clutching her doll as if she might be in danger. We walked around the cabin. Dad took dozens of pictures from every possible angle. He even got down on his stomach to get a different perspective. Can we go inside? I asked. I don't see why not. Laughing, Dad knocked at the door, just in case. When he pushed the door open, a buzzard flew out. The, the buzzard is a pretty big bird. Um, Dad and I leapt out of its way, and Erica screamed. It's just a big bird, Dad told her. A black buzzard. Nothing to be scared of. A buzzard landed, the buzzard landed on a limb and hunched there, staring at us in disapproval. Suddenly, he lifted his wings and took off, vanishing into the sky like a streak of black feathers shot from a bow. Quoth the buzzard, nevermore, Dad said. Erica looked wor worried. Can we go home now? Don't you want to go inside? Dad asked. No, she peered into the darkness beyond the door. Somebody might be hiding in there. Oh, come on. Dad took her hand and led her through the doorway, which was so low that he had to stoop to go through it, and I followed close behind. A little daylight filtered through the vines covering the windows. Layers and layers of them twisted together like tangled ropes. The dirt floor reeked of mold. The air smelled of rot and decay and old ashes. I shivered in the damp cold. Suddenly, I wanted to go back outside where the sun shone and the air was fresh. It smells bad in here, Erica whispered. Please, Daddy, can we go home? Let's explore first, Dad said. You never know what you might find in an old place like this. Although I would never have admitted it, I didn't want to be inside the cabin any more than Erica did cobwebs hung like curtains from the rafters things scuttled in the shadows mice insects i guessed weird funguses grew in the dampness what if we dislodged something and the rest of the roof caved in we'd be buried alive while erica waited in the doorway i took a few steps into the cabin dad unearthed old bottles broken pottery chipped plates and cups artifacts he said to take home to photograph. He was particularly pleased to come across the skulls and bones of several small animals, foxes, raccoons, squirrels, he guessed, that had sheltered and died there. The little bones were too much for Erica. She retreated to a low stone wall on the edge of the woods and sat in the sun, her head close to her doll's chest, her head close to her doll's head, 
having one of her imaginary conversations. I didn't like the bones any more than my sister did. I didn't like the moldy smell or the damp cold either. In fact, I didn't like anything about the cabin, and I wish Dad would finish taking pictures and get out of there. I'm going outside, I told him, to keep, uh, to keep Erica company. Okay, I'll be done in here soon. Just a few more minutes. With his back turned, he busied himself poking around in a broken down cupboard, going through things that once belonged to a long gone stranger. I sat beside Erica on the wall, glad for the sun on my back and the smell of autumn leaves. I want to go home, she said. Me too. I wish his camera battery would die. Yeah, how many pictures can he take anyway? There's nothing in there but trash and broken stuff. And bones. Erica swung her legs harder, banging her heels. I don't like bones. While she smoothed little Erica's hair, I watched a fuzzy brown caterpillar crawl softly over the stones. He had a wide black stripe across his back. And I tried to remember if that meant a cold winter was coming. The longer I sat on the wall, the more I noticed rustling noises in the woods behind us. An animal, I told myself, moving around in the fallen leaves and underbrush. I turned and peered into the trees, but saw nothing. My neck itched. Someone was there. Maybe Brody and his friends had followed us. Erica moved closer to me. Do you hear it now? she asked. Hear what? The whispering. She dropped her voice so low I could barely hear her. Erica. Erica. It's calling me. Who is it? What does it want? Despite the sun, I felt as if a shadow had passed over us. Even though I couldn't hear the whisper, I sensed that something was behind us in the woods, hidden, watching us. If I told Erica that, she'd be even more scared. So I said, nothing's calling you, Erica. You're imagining it. You must be deaf. She turned away from me and hugged the doll. At last, Dad came out of the cabin. Erica and I waited silently while he prowled around, taking pictures of anything and everything that stayed still long enough. Glassless windows, splintered boards, the dark doorway, the chimney, tall weeds, tangles of thorns. He even lined up the things he'd found inside and took pictures of them arranged like still lifes on the wall. A little skull, a cracked plate, a few dead leaves, gloomy stuff. Finally, Dad said, Come on, let's go. You'd think Erica and I, not him, were the ones that wanted to stay. He waved at his collection of junk. We'll come back later with a bag to get this stuff. Frankly, I hoped Dad would forget about the coming back. I didn't want those things in our house. They belonged to someone else. Someone most likely dead by now. The past clung to them like a stain you couldn't wash away. We headed down the trail toward home, and with Erica and me just ahead of Dad. We went slowly, cautiously, watching our step on the steep hill. Sometimes it's harder to go down a hill than to climb it. Dinner did not go well that night. Mom was upset about her job. Receptionist, ha, huh. a glorified type, typist, that's all she was. Her boss was stupid and bigoted. He treated her like a servant. Do this, do that, fix the office, go to Piggly Wiggy, Piggly Wiggly, pick up some pastries. Oh, you think that's bad, Dad muttered. Move, try moving crates of stuff around a store the size of Home Depot and some manager with a high school education tells you you're doing it wrong. Me doing it wrong? Me with an MBA? You think I like working there, wearing that big orange apron? I ignored them and tried to choke down the stew Mom had spent the afternoon cooking. When I complained that the meat was tough, Dad snapped it. that tough meat was all we could afford. It's got fat in it, Erica said. Well, then don't eat it. Dad pushed his chair back and left the table. Where are you going, Ted? Mom asked. You haven't finished your dinner. I'm an adult, Dad said. I don't need permission to leave the table. We sat in silence and listened to him climb the stairs. The door to his den closed. He'd spent the rest of the night in, in there, photoshopping his pictures. Mom stared at his unfinished dinner. Erica hugged her doll and gazed into space. No one said anything. 
The shadows, shadows of the old house gathered around us. All right, that is the end of chapter four. All right, that was a really long chapter. My apologies. Um, I am doing the videos a little longer, though, trying to get this uh, as close to Halloween as I can. I don't want to go too far past. Uh, alrighty then. Uh, we went on a field trip today with school. We went to All Seasons Orchard, I think in Woodstock, Illinois. It was, it was kind of cool, but it, it was a little bit sad because with the rain and that such we had lately it was it was muddy and it was cold so we didn't get to do a lot of the stuff that was there but what you know what we did get to do was cool we got to feed some goats and um, the kids got to play on some bouncy stuff so that was kind of nice so uh have you guys done anything for halloween or gone to any pumpkin patches or anything like that share in the comments and until next time keep reading <laughs>